This is CBC Here and Now. New details about the workers killed in the tower collapse. My friend died. My, he committed suicide. Searching for solutions and hope in Natwashish. Pulling in different directions. Changes are, uh, in my opinion, setting the sport back 15, 20 years. Well, happy summer. It is finally here. We have warm temperatures, possible thunder showers for parts of the island. All the details coming up. We begin tonight in Clarenville with the latest on the tower collapse that killed two men. Over 100 tower workers with Forbes Brothers gathered in the community today for an emergency meeting. Here now's Terry Roberts has been on site since early this morning. So Terry, what is the latest? Well, yes, Debbie, it appears Clarenville has become the epicenter of this tragedy. It's right here where most of the workers with Forbes Brothers Limited, that's the contractor, are staying in local hotels. Most of the pri any private lodging here is occupied by those workers. And of course, they've been off the job now for more than 48 hours. And a $300 million, million dollar transmission line project has been halted. Well, later today, just uh, not too long ago, actually, this was the scene at the Clarenville Event Center here. Uh, more than 100 uh, workers with Forbes Limited emerged from a meeting with company leadership. Now, as you can imagine, none of them are in the mood for talking today. Many are in shock over losing two of their co-workers. But I did manage to speak to a company vice president who told me that the company's first priority are the families of those who died. And secondly, the company wants to get to the bottom of what happened to ensure it doesn't happen again. Now, I also asked that vice president, does this, what does this mean for the safety record and the safety culture of your company? This is what he had to say. Safety culture in our company uh, is very strong and uh, um, we continue to focus and it's a, it is a priority of value within the company and uh, we'll continue to, um, to drive that culture throughout the organization. It's, uh, um, it is strong. Now, PAP also said today they are trying their best to, do, uh, to put together a back-to-work plan for workers. They're working with uh, uh, different authorities to try and make that happen, but there's no date in time. So right now, workers continue to cool their heels, mostly here in Clarenville. Now, what we also know today, earlier today, we received a news release from Forbes Brothers. They identified the two men who died in that tower collapse on Monday, and they were Tim McLean, 31 years old, from Nipigon, Ontario. And secondly, Jared Moffat, 34, from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Now, we don't know much about Mr. McLean, but we did learn a lot about uh, Mr. Moffat today. We spoke to one of his best friends who told us that Jared Moffat was a uh, uh, you know, former corrections officer who wasn't enjoying his time in that and changed careers to become a lineman and started working here in Newfoundland, a, a very much an outdoors person who lived off the land. Now, uh, one of his friends told us today that uh, you know this this was a shock to everybody every day I told him to be careful like I was just like when I talked to him man just be careful like you're, you're climbing at 200 feet or 150 feet hanging off a tower you know like you need to be careful but honestly he was careful and he wasn't stupid right like he knew he was trained and he was a smart kid and it's just a freak accident it doesn't matter how much you prepare for something right like nobody can prepare for a tower falling over like they're not supposed to fall over right like they're they're bolted at the bottom and they've got guide wires that are connected so I really don't even know honestly how that could have happened but I do know that it happened and that he was strapped to it and there's just nothing you can do right like if it goes over you just ride it to the ground that's really all you can do. Jared Moffat had a six-year-old son. Reporting live from Clarenville I'm Terry Roberts for Here and Now. Thanks for that Terry. You might call it a tempest in a teapot or a jigaloo brew ha ha. Rowers in this year's Royal St. John's Regatta say new rules dictating what can and what cannot be done to their boats are slowing them down. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. This is part of the problem. Rowers say lubricants like this allow them to slide on their seats and ultimately go faster. But this year, the regatta committee says lubricants like jigaloo are a no-no. And top rowers say that could make things a little bit sticky. To have a lubricant that allows you to slide really helps, again, you row faster. You row faster with it. The committee says Jigaloo can do damage to these seats. 
but rowers who've used lubricant for years say there's no evidence to support that claim. Or that they actually didn't do the research that they said they did. Rowers say Jigaloo is important, but it's only one of a series of changes, including new, poorly designed footboards and restrictions on how rowers can set up their oar locks. Changes, rowers say, that will keep people from joining the sport and potentially make this year's regatta much less interesting for spectators. Oh, we're unquestionably going to be slower than before. Um, if there's all the issues compounding, will take, take seconds away, and so there's not going to be any record set this year. Experienced rowers and their coaches say they're speaking out because they don't believe the regatta committee is truly listening to their concerns. The crews here have absolutely no say in what changes are being made. And the changes are, uh, in my opinion, setting the sport back 15, 20 years. The Royal St. John's Regatta Committee is defending its decision. Its president told CBC, we're always open to suggestions for the future. However, for this year, our rules are in place. So at least for this year, there may be a lot less lubricant and a whole lot more friction on the pond. Mark. Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. A frightening scene outside a St. John's business last evening. An 81-year-old woman was sent to hospital after the car she was driving left the road and slammed into the side of an office supply building. It happened at the corner of Cordage Place and Empire Avenue. The woman had minor injuries. Well, there is reaction tonight to word that volleyball has been cut from Memorial University's athletics program. Here now is Allison Sampson has that story. The men's varsity volleyball team has been bumped from Munn's court. Budget restrictions cut the team from the athletics department. The news was served up to the team yesterday. The game at Memorial University these days is cut the cost. So the men's volleyball team with its 0-17 record and a bunch of zeros in their spending column was an easy target. We look at cost of the program, um, <clears throat> and there are some other criteria as well. We look at competitive success, we look at strength of the league uh, the team might compete in, we look at um, potential for revenue generation, community support. The team wasn't that competitive, and really, there wasn't a lot of competition. Only three teams in the Atlantic region and three in Quebec. The university says it was too much money for too few games. Last year's expenses for this program were approximately $120,000. And how does that compare to other teams? Um, so the league travel for uh, this particular team uh, is the most expensive of any team that we have. Men's volleyball took the hit, but the university is still looking to save cash. We examined all of the programs and we looked for other areas as well to try to make some cuts. Um, we do have a mandate date to have ongoing evaluation of our programs um, and the criteria that we use um, are, are clear and they're set out. More than 1,000 people of all skill levels play volleyball in the province. The volleyball community is concerned what cutting the men's varsity team will mean for them. When it looks at how much money we're after committing to the program over the past 10 years. I mean, we've given over a quarter million dollars to Mon uh, volleyball programs. And at this point, I mean, we have a, the field house in there now where the only two programs that are probably going to be ran out of the, out of the field house will be uh, uh, basketball and female volleyball. The university says it will assist any student athlete looking to play at a different university. As for players with the volleyball scholarship, they can stay at Mon as long as they keep up their grades. Allison Sampson, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Easter Seals broke ground this morning for what's being called the most accessible and inclusive park in Atlantic Canada. Three, two, one, let's play. The inclusive outdoor play area is being built near the Easter Seals house on Mount Sile Road. It will include specialized swings and other equipment that can be used by people with disabilities. Half of the million dollars needed to build the park has already been raised. 23 years after he told his children he wanted his World War II medals hung on display, Cam Eaton got his wish today. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment Museum held a special ceremony to honor World War II vets and paid tribute to Eaton, who died in 1994. His medals will soon be displayed alongside of those of his father's from the First World War. Now here are some sights and sounds from this morning's event at the William Anthony Patton Building in St. John's. Gordon Campbell Eaton, or Cam as he is better known, joined the first overseas draft of 400 who left St. John's in 1940 
to join what would become one of two Newfoundland artillery units to serve in the British Army. He was allotted the service number 970001, ma making him the second one to be enrolled in the, the list. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Campbell Eaton is one of the stalwarts of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, and, and as well as the 166, as he served for, with him during the Second World War. He was the first commanding officer of the newly formed 166 Field Regiment in 1949, and, uh, and in 1968, he was made the Honorary Lieutenant Colonel of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, and by 76 he was made the Honorary Colonel. I think I need to set the record straight about one point that was made by uh, Ron Penny. Uh, we did not decide to donate Dad's medals to the museum. He decided. Uh, let there be no mistake about that. Um, he sat me down about three weeks before he went in hospital for his final uh, illness, and um, told me what was going to happen. Uh, it's extremely important and uh, you know when you have a father and son service and you know in two world wars like that and then now they're residing side by each in what we consider the home. Um, you know as the museum is a part of the regimental family here on the base and uh, it's very important to us to remember their service and sacrifice and wherever the families commit to um, you know serving in the military we certainly like to bring them together. I thank them again for entrusting these medals to our care and we promise to look after them forever. Thank you. Next, young people in Natwashish talk about what they are doing to cope during troubled times in their community. And later, Inu Grand yeah. Chief Anastasia QP opens up about what it's There's like to live in a community that spends a lot of time burying its young.
Welcome back. Uh, we're just talking about <laughs> the gorgeous weather, and we have proof that it was hot someplace, don't we? Have oh, <laughs> yeah. Lots of records were broken yesterday uh, in on the island, but I just wanted to show you this picture that was posted on Ryan Stun's Facebook page. This was sent in to us. Uh, this is Lumsden, North Beach, yesterday, and this is uh, Bailey, and uh, they posted on Ryan's uh, Facebook page that only in Newfoundland can you enjoy a 35 degree day With while standing pans. on an ice no, pan. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> and it's shallow water there. It does you look can like see shallow. The sand. You can see the bottom. That's, that's safe. <laughs> see, sun's out, gun's out. I told yeah. you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's get into uh, a quick look at some of those record breaking temperatures from yesterday. So we have Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, Springdale, Terra Nova, Twillingate, all broke records for high temperatures on June 20th. Uh, so in Grand Falls, Windsor, last year they broke uh, the record in 2016. Gander it hasn't been since 1951 that it's been that warm on June 20th. So some nice hot days uh, or nice hot places on the island yesterday. Words, Carolyn, words. All right, so uh, this is some of the weather that's on the way. It is the first day of summer. Not only that, it's the longest day of the year from sunrise to sunset. It's about 16 hours today, so I hope that you get out and enjoy that sun. We have a thunder shower risk for central parts and northeastern parts of the island tomorrow and lots of showers continuing in Labrador. Boy, oh boy, and talk about living in a fog. The South Coast still has this fog advisory in place, so there's near zero visibility when that fog rolls in. So that could stick around for another couple of days, actually. Looking ahead to tonight, we have some showers moving across Labrador in Lab City. Chance of thunder showers there, particularly in Churchill Falls overnight tonight. We have a bit of shower activity along the coastline of the island as well. So we're looking at lows in St. John's of 11 degrees, a chance of showers right along the coast. Some cloudy skies in central 13 as low there and uh, cool along the coast there in Labrador. Two degrees in Nain tonight. And you can see those uh, that risk of thunder showers in Lab City. Looking ahead to tomorrow, we have uh, some more shower activity uh, in Labrador. And tomorrow afternoon, late in the afternoon, there's a risk of thunder showers in central and along the northeast coast. So it's going to be really warm there, and uh, there's a good chance that you could see some. Uh, thunder activity there tomorrow afternoon. So here in St. John's, we're going to start the day with 15 degrees, mainly cloudy skies throughout the day. We're going to get up to 19 and uh, kind of breezy southwesterlies 30 to 50 tomorrow. And there is a chance of showers uh, for the evening hours as well. So you can see still along the coast where that fog is, it's really affecting the temperature. So only 12 degrees as the high tomorrow in Fairyland and Placentia moving into central very, very warm warm once again with that risk of thunder showers uh, late in the afternoon, but temperatures around 26 degrees for Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor, 21 for Twillingate on the West Coast. Chance of showers out there as well. Humber Valley could see uh, some thunder showers as you move up uh, on the Northern Peninsula. Much cooler temperatures, not even breaking the double digits in most places there and still lots of showers coming through and uh, still up along the coast. Very, very cool cool and uh, all throughout Labrador uh, temperatures just barely in the double digits. So it's going to be wet and cool and that's going to linger around for a little while. I'll get uh, into more details on your long range a little later. Jeremy. Thanks, Carolyn. Kids in Natwashish want more things to do. Right now, the gym is pretty much the only place they have to go to after school and they could use a distraction in these troubled times. Fires, suicide, and substance abuse in the Innu community are all making headlines. Here now is Jacob Barker stopped by the gym to see how the young people and those who care for them are making it work in this difficult time. A weeknight at the gym in Natwashish, it's the place to be. Playing hockey every day. Why is it an important, important place for you to come? Because it's fun here. <laughs> in fact, for kids in the community, really, it's the only place to go after school. What would you do if you weren't here? Um, I'd probably just be sleeping. <laughs> what they want, the same things teenagers want everywhere. We That's need more stuff in this town. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? You need more stuff. What kind of things would you want? 
like more, more educational activity. Yeah. yeah, and we need more malls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's no malls here. <laughs> we need fast internet. <laughs> the Inu gym is important for the kids because it gives them somewhere to go, and it's important for the community because it keeps them away from trouble. Kids will break it. it. Yeah, keep breaking it. Like the the kids keep breaking the playground and stuff. But recently, the trouble has gone further than that. Keep burning mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And breaking entering and stuff. <laughs> and, and, and burning house. houses. There's like gas sniffers going to abandoned houses. And this, the gas keeps, you know, it goes everywhere. Yeah. And then something bad happens. They're right. Bad things have been happening in Natwashish a lot recently. These kids live through it all. It's stressful. Like, this happening and all that. Like, my friend died. My, he committed suicide. Shanil Benuin's friend, Thunderheart Jakapish, is one of two people who took their own lives in Natwashish just last month. His father, Simeon Jakapish, former chief and deputy grand chief of the Inu Nation, spoke out about it publicly. I have my son, dead body, six feet under the buried in Natwashish today as we speak which is never going to have a voice. An inquiry should be done. What's been happening to Aboriginal youth? Janiel is finding her own ways to cope. Sometimes I go play volleyball to get things off my mind or go for a walk. She has a friend to talk about the pain of losing someone so close, but what she really wants is something from the adults, some attention. Sometimes kids want to talk to adults about their feelings, but sometimes us kids can't put it into words. The success comes from within those kids. For Jimmy Nui, this is nothing new. He grew up in Davis Inlet and moved here along with the rest of the community in the early 2000s. The hope was for a fresh start. This is my new home, a new beginning. Nothing has changed. The housing are new, the watering system is there, that's a change. But in terms of child care, parental support is not there. Everything that was in the Arizona had transferred over here. There is pride hanging on these gym walls, and there's pride in getting through to the kids. The intention of our programs is to take them off the street to more or less keep them away from the influence of other people that are using drugs. The first priority, protecting these kids from the bootleggers and the drug dealers. They should be ousted out of the community. And like the kids, he says more is needed from the adults. I would love to see other parents being involved in the children's life, but I, it will take a miracle for that to happen around here because some of, some of the youth that we have here, they lack role models. Nui is trying to be one of them, and these kids know the town needs that and more. What do you want that she to look like? Uh, I want it to look better. Like, I want it to look clean. I want it to be a better place than it was. A big task for Natwashish, for these kids, and for their future. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Natwashish. Jeremy, they, those young people, they don't seem to be asking for very much. They certainly aren't. Mm -hmm. Just a place to play and a safe place to play and uh, hopefully the community can figure it all out. Mm -hmm. And on that point, coming up next. My conversation with the Grand Chief of the Inu Nation, Anastasia Kupi, on the emotional toll of so many young suicide victims.
Welcome back. Today is National Aboriginal Day, a day to celebrate heritage, culture, and achievements. But a cloud hangs over many indigenous communities, including Shesheshi and Natwashish. It is the darkness cast by suicide. The dying of our youth is enough. Two weeks ago, Simeon Jakapesh uttered those words outside Confederation Building. His 16-year-old son, Thunderheart, had committed suicide just weeks before, the latest in a long list of young people who've taken their lives in the Innu communities. Jakapesh joined other parents and Innu leaders and tearfully pleaded with government for help. One of the parents was Anastasia Kupi, Grand Chief of the Innu Nation. Last week, we took a walk in Bannerman Park's Memory Garden, a peaceful place dedicated to those who've passed on. But Cupy's memories of those who've gone aren't always so peaceful. Grand Chief Cupy, when you stood on the steps of Confederation Building and Simeon Jakapesh said, I don't know how many times we have to bury our own people. What would I see if you took me through the cemeteries in Natwishish and Sheshashi? Well, we've had, uh, in both of communities, we've had suicides in the communities. And I think that's what you would see in our cemeteries. What can you tell me about those people who took their lives? They were young people. Um, and one of them was uh, a young mother. Um, married and had children and uh, prior to her taking her life her son had taken her life so within one family there's two family members that have been lost the last couple of years what is the impact of that on the communities on the people who live there it's turmoil because people have a lot of grief there's anger loss and it seems like um, we're spinning all the time spinning and you can't stop the spinning you are the leader of the Innu nation but you are also a mother of three you have a teenage daughter how does it make you feel when you see those young people who had lost hope and who took their lives it scares me. It scares me as um, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a grandmother. It's scary um, because I live in the community. I'm from the community. I was raised in, in my community of Shehaji. And um, so it's happening right in front of us, of, of young people. Either you hear it on social media and it's kids you know that are saying that I want to end my life or I wish a car would hit me or um, that I don't want to blame my parents. Stuff like that. And kids see that. There's a lot of social media. They talk to their friends and, uh, and, uh, and we're no different in, in the community. Does that uh, social media dialogue, does that feed on itself? It, it feeds on it because that's how young people these days and, and, and people communicate. Mm -hmm. But also um, with my example with my daughter and she lost her best friend through suicide. And my daughter is 16. And how hard has it made it for you? You must be worried about your children. Oh yeah, I'm worried about her a lot. I think about her when, when I'm not home. It's constant, constant on my mind and she's no different from from her friends from the rest of from from the rest of the the community kids and she faces the same challenges too and at that age mid teenage years how hard is it uh, to communicate mom to daughter it's pretty typical that they are seeking their own way at that age aren't they they are yeah and I know and um, I always talk to her. I always tell her that uh, I'm here and um, she needs somebody, we're, we're here. We're, we have to provide that stability. 
program chief Cupy, I'm just wondering when you were a young Innu girl growing up in Shashi, did you ever experience those feelings of hopelessness that you see now? When I was growing up in, in, in Shehajit, uh, I have a big family and, uh, and my mother uh, was a widow at an early age. Um, she didn't work, she never worked, she didn't speak English. Um, English is a second language. And, but you know what, she provided stability in that house. There was somebody to go home to, there was somebody that will feed us. And, um, and I think seeing the determination in her is what got, got me through it. And, and for me, I look back on it and, and I always am grateful to have had a person like that in our lives. No matter what I went through, I always pushed myself that I could get myself out of it. When we come back, Anastasia Cupy on solutions for her people's problems and the danger of doing nothing. Welcome back to Here and Now. Last week, I met up with Anastasia Cupy in Bannerman Park to talk about the current crisis in our Innu communities and how suicides have taken an emotional toll. She also spoke about how, as chief of the Innu Nation, many troubled families turn to her. When there's a lot of hurt, grief, and anger in our communities, people look to us to, to listen. Not so much like counseling or anything, it's not that, it's, it's to be there, to talk and have somebody listen to them. And I see in my role as being a leader, I got to keep pushing. Well, on that point, yesterday, just yesterday, you took to Facebook and uh, you made an impassioned plea to people to stop blaming each other, stop blaming government. Why did you do that? We have struggles, a lot of struggles in, in, in the community. But I know that people can do it. And uh, we've been at the doorsteps of government for the last 30 years, saying that things need to change. 
And we can do it. We can do it. I know it. And for me, when I think about it, it's like things begin at home, but we also have to have our communities accountable, but the government accountable too. Well, let's talk about your communities being accountable, specifically parents. Um, less than a month ago, an 11-year-old and a 17-year-old were seriously injured in a house fire in Natrushish. Simon Jakobash mm -hmm. acknowledged that it's known that young people are gas sniffing in abandoned homes, um, even in the streets. Why don't parents just go and intervene and take their kids back? Just help us understand that. Well, I go, well, I go back to my um, mother's generation, which is not, uh, about 60 years ago now, of being settled in our communities. And these stories, these stories are, are real because they're the ones that face the consequences of coming into the community. Our people were, were nomadic people. The children were the, the, the core of, of everybody's responsibility. Everybody paid attention. And people were strong and resilient. And then you come into the community and, and then things fall apart. And when those things start to happen, of, of things falling apart when you're in the community, of losing your parental, parenting skills, of having people take that away from you. That there's a lot of grief in that. And I heard that through my, my mother experienced that, and I seen her experience it when my older sister's kids were taken. And my, they said to my mother, they said, well, um, your daughter can't stay in the same house with the grandchildren. 30 years ago that happened, and you look at it now, my sister is 50 years old, um, she don't have a home, she got no parenting skills, uh, pro problem with addictions, and no connection to her children. And you look at those four things. 30 years ago that happened and she's still, she's still in the community. So where does that leave parents today that are still facing the same situation? We have a young population in our communities and we don't have as many elders in our communities now. Two years ago we've had 180 births in our community, both communities. And that outnumbers uh, people over the age of 50. So 180 births in two years. What is that? What future are they going to have if we don't act now? And so we came up with plans and proposals to government to say that we'll build capacity, we'll train people, we'll, um, we'll build the infrastructure in the community, we'll, we'll keep the kids in our, in our community. Problems have gone back decades now mm -hmm. and some of the problems are the same. There is, I understand, still alcohol coming into what are supposed to be dry communities. How significant is that to the problems that exist? It's very significant and that's one of the things I know that uh, we've, we've raised with the government and it seems like it's that's a struggle. People said we, we, we don't, we should ban alcohol and they did, but it's a matter of how supportive are, are the other uh, uh, government agencies to implement it. What are the solutions that you see that can get your people out of this latest crisis? I think what, what really needs to happen is that we, we had commitments from the government to work with us. There's a lot of commitments made by the, the Prime Minister and that how he wants to better have a relationship with Indigenous people. And there's all these investments of, of money supposedly going to the communities. And it's not even reaching us. We need to see it. And you feel that 
parenting skills can be taught to the families in your communities? We need to have the kids in the community to see that their parents can be supported. And uh, if you take them away from our communities, how is that going to support the kids and the parents? And we're saying we've had enough. We've had enough of our kids being sent away, um, becoming more damaged. And um, it's reaching a boiling point in our communities. You've been wearing two hats in this interview, Grand Chief of the Inner Nation and as a parent. I want to ask the parent now, what is your biggest fear for the future? My biggest fear for the future is the threats that are out there. Of more youth committing suicide and and things falling apart is what I'm afraid of in both communities. And, um, and as a parent, I am a parent. I want to see opportunities. I want to see healthy communities and, um, and strong communities and strong people. Do you see hope? I see hope. I have to have hope. She is hopeful, obviously, and a lot of people are hoping along with her. I mean, as, as she was saying, these problems go back decades. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the momentum is there now, and as she mentioned, the federal government is speaking about indigenous people's uh, issues, so That's hopefully. Great. Very powerful stuff in those two interviews, Debbie. Well Thanks. done, well Thanks. done. Thanks very much, Jeremy. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Well, I can tell you that the day we chatted in Bannerman Park was only last Thursday. It was mm -hmm. absolutely freezing. I can't believe the weather has changed it has so quickly. Really turned a corner since last week, which is great. And we're going to keep, we're going to hold on to those warm temperatures for a while now. Let's uh, jump ahead to tomorrow and uh, just see what's in store. Uh, the big thing tomorrow will be central and northeastern parts of the island and uh, the possibility of some thunder showers there, but still very, very very warm 26 degrees in central. We're looking at 19 in St. John's with uh, some cloud possibility of some showers on the south coast and uh, or on the west coast rather and in the Labrador very cool along uh, the Labrador co coast as well. Uh, five degrees in Maine as the high tomorrow. So looking ahead Thursday evening into Friday you can see lots of shower activity continuing uh, through Labrador and a little bit of it on the island as well but we're looking at a mainly cloudy day for the island uh, in central and on the west. Temperatures around 19, 20 degrees, sun and cloud in uh, St. John's and the eastern part of the island. Cooler in Labrador, there's a chance of showers all throughout the day. 15 as the high in western Labrador and 12 in eastern Labrador. So a bit cooler in Labrador as the week goes on. So looking ahead to Saturday, which you probably are, I know I am. Unfortunately, there is some rain on the way as it stands now. So you can see the system that is moving in and it's pretty, pretty dense looking, isn't it? And by uh, Saturday morning at 8 a.m., you can see it's really uh, come in over the island and heading into Labrador as well. So there's just that wave of it by Saturday afternoon. Lots of shower activity happening there on the island and in Labrador. So periods of rain right across the board for the province uh, on Saturday afternoon. Temperatures fairly mild, 17 in the east, uh, 18 in central and west and cooler in eastern Labrador, 13 as the high there and 15 in western Labrador. So if you're planning on doing anything outdoors on the weekend, you may want to hold off on Saturday and, uh, and then head on out on Sunday because right now things are looking pretty nice on Sunday in the east 
We're looking at sun and cloud and 19 degrees, 21 in central and 19 on the uh, west coast. So things are looking good. Those nice warm temperatures are going to be sticking around. A bit cooler in Labrador and lots of showers. It just keeps coming for you guys. So, uh, but things do look like it could clear off a little bit uh, later in the week. Well, let's find out who our young athlete of the day is. And that would be Gavin Coffin from Foxtrap. Gavin is 10 and is a defenseman with the CBR Renegades Adam C. All-Star Team. Yes, and this was Gavin's first time making an All-Star Team, and he was also <laughs> named Captain. Hope you had a great season, Gavin, and congrats as you are our Young Athlete of the Day. 13,000 people made their way to Stonehenge this morning to watch the sun rise for the summer solstice. Take a look at that incredible view. A little downward dog there yeah. from Stonehenge. <laughs> the, uh, the ancient site is a popular spot for many, marking the year's longest day. It's a rare chance to get up close to the mysterious monument, like they're doing there. I'd like to do that. <laughs> Yeah, Put it maybe not exactly list. that. I'd like to be there. <laughs> yeah. But they oh. look like... Welcome back once again. Let's go now to Cornerbrook, where the Halibu First Nation recognized National Aboriginal Day by holding activities in Bowwater Park. Vendors sold handmade jewelry, while others were part of a drum-making demonstration. Here now is Colleen Connors brings us this look at the event. So it's National Aboriginal Day right across Canada. We're here today to celebrate the indigenous population of the province. Most of it is all handmade and it's very made personal and with passion by the artists themselves. And it's a real big thing that they try to use their natural materials and make a personal connection with the piece to the person. It's just a recognition across Canada that, you know, the population of the indigenous people that came before us and the ones that are coming and our contribution to Canada as a whole. Well, basically, you're going to go like that and you're going to get scratched. And you wet the table. 
Uh, well, we're using the drum kits, uh, so we have to hide the babish and the rings. And uh, they were soaked overnight, and we're using uh, and we're teaching the public how to make them. So how to stretch the hides, stretch the babish, and then put it together to have a drum. So people can source their own hides. So it can be moose, deer, cow. Uh, my drum is made of deer, whereas these are cow hides. So it can be all, you know, you can get your hides from different sources. And the bab is just, just to strip the hide. Uh, so then the first part would be to stretch the hide. So we use the table, you can use other things. Uh, we use what we have, so we use the table. Uh, so we, that's, the, that's the best part, because people get hands on. Uh, so we stretch the hide, we stretch the babish as well, and uh, then we form it using the rings, and then uh, the babish ties it together. Well, the drum uh, is the, beat, uh, the heartbeat of Mother Earth, so it's very spiritual. Uh, it's very important to, if someone has their own drum, they're considered a drum carrier, but it's also very close and spiritual to them, uh, because that's, the, that's the, the heartbeat of Mother Earth, that's life. So it's very important to take care of your own drum, and a lot of that is to make it from scratch. So you have that bond with your own drum. Uh, so it's just a really beautiful experience, and they can take pride into what they have, the result that they have after. A whale carcass that washed up in Cook's Cove by Old Perlican is still rotting. But if the reaction to the dead whale in Outer Cove earlier this month reached a fever pitch, this one is barely making waves. Here and now's Avneet Dillon explains. Visitors come to Old Perlican for the beautiful views of the iceberg and the picturesque shoreline. But there's been something interrupting those views for the past three months. There's been a rotting whale carcass sitting along the shore since the end of March when it was first discovered. Personally, I would like to have seen something done a long time ago. Cliff Morgan is the deputy mayor of Old Perlican. He says fewer people visiting the remote area means less of a push to have it removed. Some people camp out for a night or two here as they're going around the province. But we don't get, I suppose, a number of people frequenting this beach that, we that you would in Outer Cove, and she wouldn't get the public outcry. Most of the whale's fat appears to have drifted away, taking much of the foul stench along with it. Prior to this, there was a concern about smell, but as you can see, the wind is blowing across the whale right onto us here now, and there's absolutely no smell there right now. Even without the smell, Morgan says the whale needs to go. He's contacted the provincial and federal governments, but isn't aware of any plan in the works to remove the whale. Hopefully, if there's nothing done with it from a Service Newfoundland and environment, then Mother Nature will eventually take its course. In the meantime, Morgan is issuing a warning for local residents and visitors. To stay away from it because you don't know what bacteria or what disease one could contract from a rotting animal like that. As for how long it will take for the diseased remains to disappear, one expert told me it could take the rest of the summer. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's. Well, a new Arctic gallery opened at Ottawa's Museum of Nature today, shining a spotlight on the past, present, and future of Canada's North. It features exhibits showcasing the fashion and culture of the North, interactive looks at flora and fauna. And a special rotating exhibit curated by Northerners. It's worth a visit no matter where in Canada you're from. I could use one of those seal as the new black shirts. <laughs> Fabulous. Wouldn't it be nice to go visit? We so should do a piece up there. <laughs> Road trip! <laughs>
Well, don't be fooled by these majestic birds you're about to see. They're actually, sorry, sorry about that. They're actually the latest technology to keep things safe at Edmonton International Airport called a robird. That's obviously robotic birds. <laughs> there are drones, but their flight behavior looks like an actual wow. falcon. That's pretty impressive. Their job is to keep wildlife out of flight paths and discourage nesting. Maybe St. John's Airport could look into something like these. I wonder would they work to keep the uh, frogs off the runway? It's apparently their know. problem these days. I don't know days. if they could get rid of the frogs. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was pretty neat. I'd like to have one as a toy, maybe. Yes, and here is our picture of the day. This is St. Anthony. Paul Alcock sent this uh, in to us uh, from Northland Discovery Boat Tours. He says that the berg is estimated to be about 500 feet long and 100 and wow. feet high. Wow, holy moly. And he says that there are like 15 to 20 icebergs in that area. So. Okay, lots of people will be flocking there. Mm -hmm. and, Big berg. Uh, that's it for us. Come back and see us tomorrow night. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Right.